Something that I say along the way will touch you. I know it. Let's begin that process of crafting a meaningful life. Here's Mary Crafts. Welcome back to Crafting a Meaningful Life. I'm Mary Crafts, and I'm always excited to be with you every single time I come. Because there's always something new to add to that piece of crafting our meaningful life, not just our so-so life and not just the life that just happens to seem to just be thrown at us, because you know I don't believe that part. I believe we draw into our lives what we're meant to have and what we want to have and what we need to have. And so we can be just victims of what are going on around us, or we can be actually proactive in creating that life that we want. Sometimes people ask me, how do you choose your guests? And how do you choose your topics? I I feel like my topics fi- pick me. I feel like my guests pick me. I think they know that I'm a person that is about making a difference, that I want to lift people. I want to leave them not depressed, all the problems that are going on in the world, but uplifted to what we can do about them. They know that I'm about the individual and I'm also about the greater whole. And I'm always thinking about that filter as I choose who I'd like to come. So today I have a really exciting guest for you, a dear friend of mine, and I want to introduce you to Brandy Vega. Welcome, Brandy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yay. (laughs) So Brandy and I became connected. I Did we first become connected? How did we first come become connected, Brandy? I think through Women Who Succeed. That was it. We both belong to an organization run by Kathy Garf called Women Who Succeed. And it's a, first of all, it's a wonderful network of professional women um, who have been successful in their careers and now have the opportunity to give back, to mentor other women who are coming up in the ranks. I didn't have that when I was coming up. You maybe had some of that, but now didn't. you didn't either. Okay, see? Um, and what it would have been like to have actually been able to turn to someone and say, so uh, how was that navigating this career and children? And how was it breaking through the glass ceiling? And what would you warn me about? And what would you praise me about? I mean, all those kind of things we'd love to talk to our mentor about if we'd had one, but now we're offering that. (laughs) So Brandy, I'd like you to start with telling my listeners a little bit about you and your background and uh, what you do for a living. And then, and then after that, I want to get into the meat of why you're here today. So my name is Brandy Vega, as you mentioned. I own and operate Vega Media Studios. When you talk about glass ceilings, there's not a lot of women in production and film. I've been doing production for 28 years. I actually, from the time I was 10 years old, knew I wanted to be a news reporter. Um, But I came from a single parent and college for me wasn't Mm. really an option. So I actually graduated high school six months early and joined the Army as a broadcast journalist and public affairs specialist. I didn't and know that. I landed, <laughs> yeah. I landed a job reporting for Fox News at just 20 years old. I was one of the youngest reporters they had ever hired. And that's kind of where my career started. And then about 10 years ago, I started my own production company. And it's been going really great. And I founded a nonprofit in 2015 as well called Good Deed Revolution. And I'm actually not officially launched yet, but we're we're launching a tech company for digital authentication because ah. that's a big deal right now. So you're not only a mover and shaker, you're an entrepreneur, you're a visionary, and you're a motivator. That's the one thing I know about you, Brandy, is that you have the ability for things that you have passion for to motivate other people. And I remember the first time I was asked to come to your studios uh, to do a podcast for someone. And I walked in, I was like, wow, this is Brandy. She's, she's impressive. <laughs> I'm so excited to know her. And then, of course, we came to the screening that you did for uh, the name of the movie again was um, Cho- Choice Conscious. I think so. Yeah. And with John Voigt. And that will just to be able to meet him for me was a thrill because I've 
been a John Voight. We're the same age almost. And so I've been a fan for a long time. And just every interaction I have with you, I find you engaged, engaged to the nth degree. You're not letting life just like hit you. You're hitting life. (laughs) You know, I was thinking about it. I got to write a chapter in a book last year. And that was always on my bucket list is was to be able to write a book. Um, So I just did a, a chapter. But one of the things I thought about as I was writing that is this quote. Life is what's given. Opportunity is what's taken. None of us get to choose what we're born into or what we're, what hand we're dealt, but we all have a choice at the end of the day on what we choose to do. And that's our opportunity. So I try to look at things and say, okay, what can I do with this? What am I supposed to learn from this? How can I build and make life the best it could possibly be? And I think that brings us to our topic for today, which is exactly what happened to you through a traumatic experience with your daughter. So let's start there. So in 2019, I almost lost my 12 year old to suicide. I was working on an NFL production and all of a sudden I getting ready for a live broadcast and I look at my phone and I see that I have 25 missed calls. And, um, you know, your heart sinks, you're like, something's going on. And, um, that was the first time my daughter attempted to end her life. And at that point in time, we didn't talk about it. I mean, she spent a few days in the hospital. She spent a few weeks in the inpatient facility, but I felt like such a failure, all the stigma. I'm a single mom. I was divorced for almost 10 years. And so I have my daughters and I was raising them. I had just actually adopted a baby from foster care and I was a surrogate. So I'd had a baby for a friend. I had just gotten this little boy through foster care. And then I had my older daughters and she didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it. It was something we just decided she made a promise. It would never happen again. Well, fast forward almost exactly two years later, uh, police were banging on my door in the middle of the night And when I got there, they said, go check on your kid. And thankfully, her friend had the courage to call 911, or it might have been a completely different outcome for us in finding my daughter. And I I was terrified. I had been volunteering as a way to pay it forward at the hospital for about five years at that point doing spiritual care. And nobody dies alone. And I had sat with a lot of families and patients who had attempted to end their life or who had ended their life. But this was really an eye opener as a parent. And it was, we weren't entirely entirely sure if she was going to live. And um, the second day, that night we got to the hospital, though, I think this is important because I just found a new study that just came out that says kids age 10 to 17, um, the number of suicides have gone up 71% since 2010, which I find absolutely mind blowing to think that, you know, what, what happened from 2010 to 2023 that has increased suicide rates from 10 to 17 year olds, 71%. And that's according to, I want to make sure that I cite it. It's trust for America's health, but they have a lot of things from CDC and whatnot. Um, So when my daughter did it again, I was, sitting in the parking lot and I had gotten to primary children's, they didn't even have a bed for her. They said, we've had so many suicide attempts today. We don't have a bed. And then over almost a dozen, 10 suicide attempts or so that day, What? the next day, we still weren't sure if my daughter was going to pull through or if she was going to have long-term lasting effects from what happened. And, um, I sat in the car at primary children's and I had an emotional breakdown in the parking lot. And I went on my personal Facebook page and I said, I don't know if my child's going to live or die. And I know some of you have been through this. I need help. I need to know what to do. I knew I couldn't do the same thing from before and expect a different result. And overnight that video went viral. I think I woke up to 12 or 15,000 views. I had hundreds of messages from people who I would have never thought were going through this and they were, and they had gone through it personally. So this is one thing with suicide and mental health, rich, poor, young, old, black, white, doesn't discriminate whatsoever. And everybody's being directly or indirectly impacted. In fact, 
it's what's called the grand challenge for the globe right now, where there's, I think, over 17 countries working on how do we work, how do we fix mm-hmm. this? And, and the number one thing is to try to stop the stigma. Yeah. I mean, just, there's so much in there. I'm going to go back and try and re- <laughs> remember uh, some of my questions. So talking about that first time that she attempted and your solution, you, her solution as well was to not talk about it. Um, let's yeah. just ignore it. That was, you know, there and then, and this is here and now, and we're just going to move on, even though you had that little blip. In retrospect, yeah. what do you tell parents now who have that kind of shout for help? I think one is err on the side of love always and and find help. There's help. There's resources. The problem is most people don't know where to go. It's not something we actively look for until we actively need, need it. And so that was one thing that I found. Um, in the beginning, it's hard. My child didn't want counseling. We went for about six weeks and, and the counselor finally said, this isn't doing her any good. She doesn't want to be here. You know, she didn't want to take the medication. And so, you know, we kind of let it slip. But I think the biggest thing back then was I was afraid of the stigma. And I know she was too, because we felt like I felt like a failure. I felt like people are going to think I'm a horrible mom, that my kid doesn't even love me enough to live. And that maybe I spent too much time building my, but I, I mean, just all the fears and yeah. thoughts that we ha- tell ourselves and, and there's not, that has nothing to do with it. I learned something about a year and a half ago that maybe I can share briefly that really changed my thoughts on, on suicide. Um, I was working with the suicide prevention coalition with AFSP and NAMI, and mm-hmm. they were giving us some safe messaging training and they talked about the twin towers when the people at the top floor jumped Technically, they died by suicide, but we never judged them and said, hey, suck it up. Hey, come out of it. Snap out of it. You're okay. We just felt like that was acceptable because of the circumstance. And they said people who die by suicide, they feel that same level of heat, that same level of pressure. They feel like the only escape and the only answer is to take that jump and and that kind of shifted yeah. my thought process on that because sometimes it's hard. I go, you know, my kids have everything. They didn't grow up like I grew up. They weren't poor and hungry and, you know, they never had to struggle. And it's hard sometimes to understand why people are struggling because you look at them and it seems like they've got this great life. But in their mind, they're up on the top of that tower with the smoke and yeah. the burning and the fear and the pain. And they feel like the only option is to take that leap. And so that's helped me to be a little bit more thoughtful in in the way I look at it. That was like a huge example. And I'm going to remember that example forever. And sometimes when I hear of people committing suicide or mothers who have left their children or fathers or young people, and that is my exact thought always is what must the pain have been like inside that killing themselves was a better option than living with that pain, whatever it was and however it was. And when you talked about um, your feelings of when she first made her first attempt and that feeling of what's wrong with me and that you were the failure And I'm sure that that there were those feelings inside of her as well. And the, it just keeps coming back to me, Brenda. It doesn't matter who I interview on this podcast. The one message I walk, the one message I walk away with every single time is that the healing can start only when the hiding stops. And then as you, later then began to walk out of the hiding part, then truly that healing part was able to start. How was the second time for you? So the second time was a real eye opener. I was shocked. 
you know, I yeah. guess I probably shouldn't have been, but I was, I was just terrified and I thought I can't do the same thing. And, you know, I was in the hospital and I was praying to God, please save my child, please save my daughter, save her. I'll do anything. And I got the overwhelming impression or message that just said, I'll give you a second chance, but there won't be a third. What are you going to do? And I just thought, okay, why am I, you know, they say, um, life happens for you, yeah. not to you. And so I thought about that. Like, what are we supposed to learn? What are we supposed to do? So after I shared that video asking for help, um, I used to work in news. I was a news reporter, as I mentioned. And my friends at the NBC affiliate called me and they said, Brandy, will you share your story on the news? And I said, heck no. This was, you know, right around the time we, we still weren't sure. It was two or three, four days after. Yeah. I said, no, no way. I'm not going to be, I, I don't want to be the face or the voice. I don't want to be vulnerable. I want to respect privacy. And, you know, then I had that impression that, am I supposed to learn? Am I supposed to do something with this? Am I supposed to learn? Is there a lesson here? Why are we going through this? And they called me again after she woke up and, you know, <laughs> I don't want to cry, but I'm going to cry. It's okay. I, when we she, cry a lot here. I, so it's okay. <laughs> I said, baby, are you glad you woke up or do you wish you would have died? And she said, mom, I didn't really want to die, but it was too late. And so I'm here doing this for all the people who didn't really want to die or who don't really want to die, but they feel like it's too late. And so Kate, my friends at NBC called me again about a week later and said, Brandy, this is a huge problem. Will you please reconsider? We we've got to talk about this and nobody will talk. And I thought if I'm terrified, and I'm used to being on TV. I've been doing this in front of cameras for 20 years. Yeah. I can't imagine what a normal parent or person would feel like. And so I reluctantly did the interview and I said, parents, if you're watching this right now, stop what you're doing. Just stop and go ask your kid point blank. Are you suicidal? Don't beat around the bush. After the story aired, I got a message from a father and he said, you just saved my daughter's life. I said, what do you mean? He said, I saw your story on the news. I went to go check on my child. She had already written her suicide note and was getting ready to end her life. And I caught her just in time. We're at the hospital. And then I got another message from a family who said, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your experience. We talked to our son and he confessed he had a plan to end his life this weekend. We're getting him help. Huh. And so that's what's led us to where we are right now. Because I thought of my little personal story, my heartache, my heartbreak, but sharing it could save two that I know of out of 20 or 30,000. What if we could reach 200,000 or 2 million or 20 million or, you know, whatever. And so we started a, an event last year called Live Live. We did it on September 10th, which is World Suicide Prevention Day. And I, I mean, it was hard as could be. I bootstrapped. I pulled it together. We had 60 entertainers, speakers, survivors, and we shared three hours of hope, help, healing, education, inspiration. And we were able to reach 160,000 people. Wow. And we're this year, we've kind of revised it. And I'm so excited about it. What um, date is it this year? I want to make sure I put it in my calendar. It's always going to be September 10th okay. for our show. September okay. 10th is World Suicide Prevention Day. So we oh, want that okay. to be consistent. so consistent. Okay. But what we're doing this year is we've also included a promise to live challenge. We want this to be bigger than the ice bucket challenge. And what we're asking people to do is you can go to promise, the number two, promise to live.org. And we're asking people, whether you struggle or not, Mary, right now, if you ever feel sad, depressed, hopeless, or suicidal, mm. that you'll reach out to a friend, a family member, a trusted resource, or call or text 988. Studies show that people who make a promise ahead of time are much more likely to keep it. So that's step one, promise to live. Once they make the promise on there, we send them a certificate that gives them a visual representation and reminder like that. that they made this promise, that they can look at, print, save, whatever. And then there's a click button to share on social media. And when they share it on social media, they help stop the stigma, start conversations, yeah and save lives. And this is part of that grand challenge because again, it, the first step is stopping stigma and connecting. People feel isolated. They feel hopeless. They feel like nobody cares. Since I've been outspoken on this for the last two years, I've become a safe space. Right. I've become a safe person. 
I can't even tell you weekly how many calls, texts, emails I get because people know that I can relate and that I've been through some of it. I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm a safe space. And that's kind of what this campaign aims to do is get people to promise because that's the first step. I think that's going to save a lot of lives. And it, it literally every 40 seconds, Mary, somebody dies by suicide. What? In, in about every 40 seconds. As long as we've been doing this, how many people have died by suicide? In the United States? We, it, globally. Globally. Even globally. Yeah. Every 40 seconds. It's 800,000 people a year. Wow. Now, if that's not an epidemic, I don't know what is. But every 40 seconds. So our promise to live.org, when you go there, in less than 60 seconds, actually around 40 seconds, you can make the promise, share the promise in that same amount of time and look at the impact. Everyone always says yeah. they want to help. And and last year, here's my quote that kind of got me through last year. I'll share, share it with you. It's from Da Vinci. He says, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. We all know there's a problem. We all say we're willing to help, but what are you really yeah. doing? So here's something you can tangibly physically do right now Go to promise to live.org. Make that promise. Often we don't honor ourselves enough. <laughs> you know, if, if I if I tell myself I'm gonna diet and exercise or whatever, I'm gonna say only nice things, it doesn't hold the same weight as if I tell you that, because then I feel an expectation. I feel that I, as a person, I love you and maybe respect you more than I do myself. And and most of us are like that. So making a promise. Yeah. can literally save lives, I believe. The, the the power of the promise is huge. We've seen that in so many different areas of our lives. And so many different people talk about that. Uh, one thing I want you to know, Brandy, that on the end of this podcast, we're going to include the link to that beautiful website, promise2live.org, where people can go on and make the pledge themselves, have their families make them. Uh, but what I encourage even more people to do is to think about your company or where you work and and having the power of having the company make one together and then they'll take it out to their families. So I really invite people to think about that and the impact that they can have. And, you know, just like my introducing you to companies that I know uh, my old company, Culinary Crafts, I talked to them already, and I talked to, to Whitney, as you know, and different people. We can spread this word. And the fact yeah. that this is the thing you shared with me before, before we talked about being on the podcast, that by making this promise, you have, you've increased your percent of, of living by 80%. Yeah. I mean, there's not a specific study directly for this, so we're careful to use the percentages, but we've found studies in the past linked to similar type things that show a 60 to 80% increase in keeping a promise. Now, while we can't make claims that doing the promise to live will increase any numbers, there's plenty of studies that show that it highly yeah. increases the likelihood of keeping it. So at this point, doing something is better than doing, doing nothing. nothing. I think about that. If I had been contemplating suicide, if I had made a promise, I think it would affect me, Brandy. Because I think about simply like in, in weight loss or fitness goals that I have in making a promise to myself is different than setting a goal. Seems like goals yeah. you can kind of come and go with. You know what I mean? But a promise is something very different. Recently, in fact, within the last month, my daughter, who is now 32, shared with me that in high school, she had contemplated suicide many times. And I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know. And what would I have done if I had known? Well, I can tell it wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't be what I did do, which was nothing, <laughs> And so to even start this conversation, the conversation can start about something so really non-threatening as promise to live. Hey, I heard this podcast, you know, they're, they're making a promise to live. And, and what would you feel as a family if we did that or, you know, in a group at work or whatever thing? And anyone who is contemplating it 
at that moment, as they hear people, their concern and their desire to help come forth, may be willing to come forth themselves and say, yeah, that's me. I think of like the Mm -hmm. night that I was at the Supriya Gala, which is for childhood sexual abuse. And one in four um, children is the average in the world or in the United States. And it's the same average here in Utah. Um, One in four women, girls are sexually abused. So at this table of eight, I said, if those stats are true, that means two of us at this table have had childhood sexual abuse. I said, that just blows my mind because I know all of you. And I was kind of just going on like this. And all of a sudden, two women just raised their hands. And said, that was me. I was one. And the whole table would just realize the presence and the the problem. And we wanted to help. If we start the discussion about suicide, specifically teenage suicide, then the awareness, as people say, I've thought about it many times, gives them a safe place. To talk. You know, Mary, I was, that's so true. And we don't know who's going through it. In fact, I was at a conference and I was sharing the promise to live. And I talked to this beautiful lady. She was 66, I think. And she was widowed. And I just said, you know, Hey, we're doing the promise to live. And, and she's like, I don't want to live. And I said, you're, you're beautiful. You seem like you've got a great life. She's like, nobody cares. Nobody wants me around. I don't even want to be here anymore. And it just broke my heart because here was this vibrant lady who just came walking by and just our conversation. And I said, will you promise me that you'll reach out? And she made the promise to me directly. And it's just, it's people you would never expect. It's, it it just happens. And, And I want to share this too, you know, as I challenged people on the NBC story, ask your loved ones point blank if they're suicidal. That's your spouse, your parents, your siblings, your kids, your friends, your neighbors. You don't have to beat around the bush. It's not, people say it's a scary conversation. No, it's a, it's a safe, healthy, natural, it needs to be a normal conversation. And by asking somebody that in the past, people were afraid. They're like, we can't say suicide. We can't mention the word because if we do, then we might plant that seed. Uh, False. That's not going to happen. It's been proven that asking somebody when, when I ask a hard question and I say, if, if I asked you that right now, Mary, are are you feeling suicidal? When you ask an honest question, yes, you do. And either they are, or they aren't. And you're going to be surprised at the people who are, I attempted suicide myself at 12. I became an advocate. I taught suicide prevention. I was with the attorney general 15, 20 years ago, going into schools and teaching suicide prevention. So how did I miss it with my daughter? Yeah. Well, because it, it, while you have some triggers and some warning signs, it's hard to navigate those, you know, preteen, puberty, junior high emotions, all the things that you go through in transitions. Sometimes they go through with suicide. I'm an army veteran. My husband has PTSD. He's an army veteran and law enforcement. There's a lot of people dealing with a lot of things right now. And we just need to connect. We need to stop the stigma, start conversations, save lives. It's that simple. And people can do it if we start talking about it. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned with the companies, I've said all along, there's zero ego here. It's only about impact. We've got USANA which is a health and science company. They are all in with this initiative. They have, I think, hundreds of thousands of distributors globally. They're going to be pushing the the Promise to Live campaign and challenge. We have Unify.org, which is a fantastic nonprofit. We're working with the Suicide Prevention Coalition, the Grand Challenge. We want to work with everybody because this is something that affects all of us, and it's something that we can all agree on and unify together to to fight and stop the stigma because you don't want to wait until it's your loved one. Yeah. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Mm. That's true that, you know, I've lived long enough now that there definitely have been people that I have known that are in my sphere. There are definitely a lot of women that I know who are a little bit older, 
not quite as old as me, but a little older, whose children have committed suicide. And that's how I've become so close to so many of them is they made a post on social media and I just responded because I felt their heart. And then we just became good friends after that. And I'm one of the lucky ones, Mary. I got a second chance. I have so many people on my advisory panel that never got that. I had a, a, a friend who lost her father and her son. There's another lady who's lost three of her children to suicide. And, and there wow. is this thing about, you know, safe ways to talk about it, safe ways to deal with it, contagion, um, the odds of another family member taking their life. In, in my group of spiritual care and volunteers, we had a 50-year-old father who lost a 70-year-old father to suicide, then his 18-year-old son to suicide, and then he took his life. Three generations gone in less than a year. This is a problem, but it's solvable. It's curable. There, There's a solution and we can do it, but we have to step up and, and not say, well, I haven't been impacted. We have to just step up and do something. And, and that's kind of what we're here to do. It's like, okay, well, what can I do? Well, you can do this. And for me, there has to be purpose and pain or what's the point of life? Yeah. If we don't learn and grow from, from the hardships, then what's the point? Pain for pain? No, I don't subscribe to that model. There has to be some purpose in it. And that's what I'm trying to make through our pain is to make sure other people don't have to go through it. And every day I'm seeing it. Struggle is not failure. Struggle is the opportunity for growth. Yep. You know, Brandy, as I think about this, the one question that just keeps coming back to me over and over is, from 2010 to now, a 71% increase in teen suicide. So from it, the 10 to 17 year olds. Yeah. yeah. So it begs the question, why? Any thoughts? Well, a lot of people lean toward social media, social media, smartphones. Kids are losing connection by thinking they have connection with fake groups. You know, there was a girl um, overseas who posted on her Instagram page, I'm feeling kind of depressed. Should I kill myself or not? And 69% of her so-called friends said yes. And she did. So I think it's, I think it's the disconnection. I think it's potentially, I mean, I'm no expert in this. I'm just giving you my opinion. Maybe the breakdown of the fa the family, maybe our, our self-worth, our view of ourself. We just, people don't, value their life like they used to the pandemic the pandemic didn't help at all um that was very very hard for a lot of people and so there we just have to look at it smart and safe technology and i know i'm changing the way i i love gab which is a fantastic yes. phone provider for my safe grandchildren technology. all have that phone yep yeah yeah. And my little boy, I've got a six-year-old now. So I've got a 21-year-old, 16-year-old and a six-year-old. And I can just tell you, he will not have the same access that my older kids have because when you know better, you do better. Yeah. And I see the harm in it. I, I see the harm in it as an adult. Yeah. And you think we know how to navigate, but these, these kids, it's just really, really hard. But that's, I mean, that's kind of what I can attribute it to. I don't know for sure. Well, there are food. certainly tons of studies out there. And we see it now all over the news that when the Surgeon General of the United States came out and said, wanted to put a, a warning, just like they did on cigarettes, smoking yeah. can be hazardous or is hazardous to your health. And that they want to put that warning on social media. That the well, consumption the of is just ridiculous. Cigarettes, nicotine, all of that. That was the grand challenge a few decades ago, because, yeah. you know, at first it was kind of popular. It was cool. Everybody was doing it. And then all of a sudden the world came out and said, wait, this is addictive. It's bad. It can cause cancer. That's what they're doing right now yeah. with a lot of these things. Yeah. And that's why it's now the grand challenge because we're losing so many lives to yeah. mental health and to suicide to say, okay, what's causing this and how can we fix it? And the best place to start is stopping the stigma, which when we do that allows us to have the conversations because we don't know the exact answer. But we know some steps that can help mm -hmm. and connection helps a lot. And, and just being able to talk about it, there is help. There's a fantastic resources like AFSP.org, NAMI, NAMI.org. These are great, great resources that I hope people jot down. You know, I've been thinking, I've been reading a book called How Things Change. 
And I tell you, I have loved this book because I'm involved in so many of those organizations that are trying to make change. And I thought about in my lifetime, people have said to me, well, the train has left the station. You're not going to stop or change social media. I'm like, well, let's look at some of the trains that had left the station. Riding yeah. in cars without seatbelts. My mom, we never, we didn't even have them in our car. So my mom used the, you know, arm seatbelt that whenever it stopped, she'd throw out her arm. And as a young mother, mother, I found myself doing the same thing, even though my kids now had seatbelts. That changed. There were so many ads on TV where the woman sitting here in a wheelchair saying, I didn't want to wear it because it would wrinkle my dress. And then you see her in her wheelchair. I mean, right. as growing up in the 50s and 60s, I didn't know what it was like to be in a smoke-free environment. And the change yeah. that we created because of that. I didn't know that we could actually reduce drunk driving. And that we would even get the alcohol companies on board to say, drink responsibly. So yeah. you think about now, if social media got on board and the owners of social media, and they participated in campaigns that put warning signs up instead of ideation of suicide that said, consuming this will be harmful to your health. These are the, right. and they did more teaching of classes, social media themselves. We got the, I mean, just think about all those people who, we got the whole auto industry to go to the expense of putting seatbelts in the car. We can right. do this. We can make those kind of changes, but we have to first be willing to recognize and say the problem. Yeah, I agree with that. Utah is leading the way in, in this. They're really, really trying, and the Huntsman are as well yeah. with all the, the investments that they're putting into it. But there's still so much work to do. And, and we talk about the causes and safe tech. Just thinking about AI and deep fake technology, yeah. we think people are struggling now. The, the easeability for people to put others into situations for bullying, for yeah. um, extortion in porn. Like it, it's getting so scary every single day. It gets more and more scary. And I think that this is going to be another trigger for mental health and suicide that we just have to be alert and we have to start talking about it and opening up and, and finding ways to combat it. And that's what we're doing. And that's what people can do with this campaign. Yeah. The AI part for me is, is, has a lot of use, but it's with everything abuse. And oh, yeah. I actually tried, it was on my phone that I could try it to write a letter. So I write, I wrote, I touched and said, write a request for a refund. And they just worded it so beautifully. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what if instead, that AI typed a message to one of my teenagers and invited them to do something else. They could make it sound yeah. so flowery, so beautiful, and just mass produce it. So there are so many things, Brandy. That's why I do this podcast. It's because I right. want all of us to walk in life with our eyes wide open. Yes. Done is the time where we're putting our hands in the head in the sand and saying, well, that will go away or that'll change. I mean, yes, it's less now, but now the pandemic's passed. It'll all get better. Wide open, Brandy, just like you, just like me. That's the invitation here. I think that's how we do this. That's how we craft this meaningful life is <laughs> just like yeah. eyes wide open. And it doesn't take a lot. I mean, everybody always says somebody should do something about that. Someone should do something. Guess what? You're the someone. You're the somebody. We all have to stand up. We have to do our part. We can't count on other people to do it. So, you know, lift where you can. Yeah. Make contact. Reach out to somebody today. Send a message. Send hope. Smile at a stranger. One of my friend's daughters was contemplating ending her life, and she was standing on the corner of a very busy street, and she thought to herself, if anybody acknowledges me or says anything, I won't step in front of the bus. And just at that time, as she went to step down, 
somebody hollered across the way with their window down and said, you are beautiful. Wow, you're gorgeous. And she stepped back up. She said that one little comment saved her life. Yeah. So we don't know if our email, if our outreach, if our post, if our whatever it is we're doing has the impact to do that. But so many people are struggling in so many ways. So just be kind, choose kindness, reach out, show love, make the promise and share it. I love that. And reach out for help if you need it. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not. You would reach out for any other condition. Mm -hmm. And we hope that people realize that it's okay to not be okay. And it's better to get help. The world's better because you're here. We need you. Whether you think you're loved or not, you are. Yeah. And there's value and there's hope. And just please don't give up. So as we close today, Brandy, I'm thinking of two things. One is just those random acts of kindness that we can do to help. Yesterday, I was having breakfast in a in a cafe and I always try and leave some compliment with the waitress with something. And I was struggling <laughs> yesterday <laughs> and yeah. I happened to notice her lips and I told her what beautiful lips she had. I said, your Cupid bow is so perfectly formed. I said, you should do lip modeling. She drew the biggest smile she says, I never feel pretty. And I said, well, let me tell you, just start showing those lips off. They're like really something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it changed. Yeah. It was a small thing. But when those random acts of kindness strike people, they can make a difference. And the second right. thing, Brandy, is to go to your website. That every one of my listeners can make a difference today in their lives and their families' lives and their neighbors' lives by simply going to your website. So tell us the website again and your invitation. It's promise to the number two. We're asking for two things for you to take it and to share it. Promise to live.org. Mm-hmm. Again, it doesn't mean you're struggling, but it means if you ever are struggling that you'll reach out for help to a friend, family member, 988. And 988 is fantastic. It's, it's, free to use. You can text, you can call. Um, But we really want you to share this on social and maybe share your thought if you feel like it. But if not, just share the, share the challenge and ask your loved ones to do it. Who knows that little 60 seconds you take to do could save somebody's life and your network that you don't even know struggling. Maybe they don't know about the resources that are available. So we just hope that people will get involved and, and not just brush this off, but, you know, stop what you're doing right now. Go to promise to live.org, make the promise, share the promise. And the next challenge I want to give you is reach out to somebody you love today and ask them point blank if they're feeling suicidal. Mm. And if they are, there's great resources you can go to nami.org, afsp.org, live on. Um, dot org. And there's plenty of resources for help. 988, you can call or text. They've got crisis teams and they can give you resources as well. You're not alone. And and if you're struggling in any, any other way, 211. Yeah. Call that number and ask for help. You don't have to do things alone. That's not what this life is for. There's help. Uh, thank you, Brandy. This is the perfect podcast for this month of mental health awareness. And that this is something we can do because we do want to heal selves. We want to heal others. And you are the perfect example, Brandy, of how we do this as one. Not alone. Thank you. But together. I love your heart. I love your soul. I love the work you're doing. And you know what? We all have the power to be the one. Yeah. So I hope you'll go out and do it. Thank you for allowing me Uh, to share this. Thank you so much for helping us craft our meaningful life. Namaste. Listen to the full podcast today and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Crafting a meaningful life with Mary Crafts.